um, of all the pieces I've read anywhere, of, of all the pieces anyone has ever written about Montague Allman or his process, um, I've seen no other piece of writing like Marco Civilo's um, article, The Tale of Two Telephone Poles. And I've uh, asked Marco to read this for us. And um, he, and the thing is that he's caught the spirit of Montague Allman and the spirit of the process and the, um, the spirit of what we do. And I remember when Marco and I and some others were on a boat, we were dumping Monty's ashes in the sea off the, the coast of Sweden. And Marco had his camera. And when the ashes were dumped in the ocean, a lot of people took pictures. But Marco looked up and he smiled and he said, I got it. He caught the picture. And th that's what he did with this, this, this essay he wrote. So I'm going to give the screen over to Marco. To, to read this to us. Okay, Marco, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is my tale of two telephone poles. What I have written uh, uh, 20 years ago, but when I saw uh, Montague Ullman the first time. Then it was autumn 1980 in Boden, which is a little town in northern Sweden. I worked there as a psychiatrist when I heard my fellow workers talking about psychoanalysts who was coming to lead a dream group there. They asked if also I was interested to participate, but I said, no. The reason for my negative reaction was that I did not want to experience again the claustrophobia I had so intensely experienced during my psychiatry training when, according to my teachers, every oblong elongated object symbolized a penis and every ball like formation a vagina. How could this psychoanalyst be different? My claustrophobic experiences continued throughout my studies, but fortunately, only a couple of them were so grotesque as this first encounter with traditional psychoanalytic thinking. My fellow workers in Warden did not give up, but continued persuading me to attend the dream group. At last, I gave in. This decision turned out to be one of the most important turning points in my life. During the first workshop days, the strange feeling about the leader of the group, Montague, Monte Ullman, began to grow stronger. This man did not interpret anything, but in an extremely gentle way I had never seen before, guided the group to listen to the dream. I saw for, for the first time how the dream opened into its full glory, beginning to speak with its own voice to the whole group. There was something in him, 
something I recognize deeply inside myself, some similarity, some indefinable connection, resonance. Longing for something long ago forgotten and lost, I recognize the living force inside me, a spark of energy I have always been after, something beyond all explanations and theories. I saw this man catch the uncatchable, creating the atmosphere where the dream was able to burst into flower in all its touching innocence. And how different we still were, he and I. I was young. He was old. I spoke English labori laboriously, and he was fluent, of course. We were from different cultures, living on opposite sides of the earth. But all these differences could not explain away the common factor. He was a stranger to me, and at the same time, he was not. The second dream group day dawned. Monte asked who had a dream to share. No one had. And he then said he had one. It was a short sequence, and it was about me. In his dream, I had come to his hotel room and asked two questions, which he did not remember, nor his answer to the first one. But the answer to the second one was this. In his dream, he took me to the window of his hotel room and pointed at two telephone poles outside. He said to me, if you understand why those telephone poles are just there and nowhere else, you have received the answer to your questions. That was Monte's dream and the turning point for me. Monte said he did not know the message of the dream, but I did. The dream immediately opened to me. The opening was not a logical process, but a strong immediate emotional impact. The dream symbolized perfectly the intriguing feeling I had had about Monte during the previous day. There we were, Monte and I, like two telephone poles, irrevocably apart, without, without any possibility to come closer to one another. And that was just like I had felt it the day before. But between the two poles there was an electrical unifying current. And that was just like I had felt it the day before. The dream said that if I understand the position of the poles, I have received the answer. I understood and received the answer just like the dream said I would. This dream illuminated my feelings much more clearly than what I alone had been able to understand about our communication. The last act of this dream was played 
out 20 years later. I had been busy some months building up Montes internet site, scanning hundreds of pages of material which Monte kept sending me partly through fax. One night, my wife coming and looking over my shoulder to see what I was doing, said to me, now the dream has really come true. Pointing to me the way Monte and I were communicating, we, the two telephone poles, were there again, the connective current of faxes flowing through the telephone lines between us. Now across the globe. Then I felt that the dream at last had conveyed its contents at all levels. This incident gave me the key to dreams, which during the following years has helped me to maintain my faith in the incorruptible core of all human beings, irrespective of how deeply it may have been buried behind our barriers, which we have put up against each other in our daily struggle of existence. Dreams have been the oasis of innocence, the purity of the human soul during my journey in the competitive atmosphere of our culture. Dreams are the connective healing network for us who have lost our way to the connectedness of the human species. And that was my story about the telephone poles. That, that's a very beautiful story. It touches so much. And you ended in connectedness. And Monte always said that different people had different ideas for the meaning of dreams. But he said the dreams are about our connection with other people that today is threatened so much by, like you say, the ways of the world. That was a beautiful ending. It was, it's really, uh, do you want to say anything you're feeling now about this piece you wrote? You caught the spirit of Montague Allman when you used the word gentle. He was the most gentle man in the world. Um, I myself got under his skin sometimes. <laughs> he wasn't too gentle with me, but he was really the most gentle person. And with dreams, nobody could handle a dream so gently with loving care as he did. So you caught the spirit there. And then you, yes. and you you talk about beyond beyond all expectations and theories, catch the uncatchable. That that's what dreams are, you know. <laughs> there are a lot of theories about dreams, but I just don't read them anymore because dreams themselves are so much more fascinating because they do catch the uncatchable. And um, you you really said it so beautifully. And you said another thing. You said that Monty was a stranger to you, and at the same time, he was not. And this is true for dreams. Our dreams come to us, and we don't know what they mean. They're strangers to us, but at the same time, where they're not. And our job in the dream group is to, is to, is to work with that. I, I think you said, so it's a, do you want to say anything more? You did a beautiful job with this essay, and you read it beautifully. Oh. So, so I think that... I have said the most important, and that has now with me in my heart always. I remember Monde so often, and his uh, leading light still in my journey here. Yeah, 
Me too. He really guided so many people, and we're still on that on that journey. Um, but Ma, um, Marco has made a website of all Montague Oman's writings and and all kinds of things like that about Montague Oman, and um, it's really worth going to and looking into. Okay, Marco. So I'm gonna I'm gonna in the um, in the video now. Um, Okay. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you.